Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our um, fourth webinar on the uh, Real World Project Management Series. I'm delighted to be joined uh, in this series by Sarah Coleman, who is the Director of Business Evolution. Uh, Sarah is also a Fellow of APM. Uh, she's a highly experienced practitioner with 25 years experience. She's also carrying out some of our key research and particularly in the field of leadership, um, working together with Cranfield. So what I like to think about Sarah is she's actually a sort of academic as well as a practitioner. So I have sort of coined the term for her as pracademic. I'm not sure whether Sarah would agree. So Sarah, without further ado, I would like to hand over to you. So just to say um, the format will be approximately uh, 30 minutes you'll hear, 30 to 40 minutes you'll hear from Sarah on her topic and her research. Um, and then I invite you to submit your questions via the question panel. Um, there'll also be a question that Sarah's posing to you, which will be on the chat panel. Um, and then when Sarah will sort of tell you when she wants you to answer and what she wants you, um, how she wants you to put the answer. And then we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, Sarah. Over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, Rebecca very kindly introduced me, so I'm not going to say too much uh, more about myself and, and what I've done, uh, except to, to say that pracademic is one of the terms that, that Rebecca used. Certainly new to me, but I think it nicely sums up my continuing practitioner work with projects and transformation, um, as well as my continuing interest in research into projects and programs. And I'm trying desperately to move this uh, slide on. So bear with me a minute. Well, hopefully this actually takes. Sarah, what, what you might have to do is just click out of the side panel and quick it'll click back into your slide deck, and that should usually do it. Bear so, um, with me. Okay, let me try that. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Right. So, um, over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about how thoughts about project leadership have evolved over the last years. Um, and applying leadership ideas and concepts to project management is a fairly recent concept in literature, certainly. Although I have to say it's been practiced for as long as the world has been undertaking projects. And most of the leadership concepts we know today originated with warfare, so think Sun Tzu and the art of war around 500 BC, with politics as well, and then certainly in the UK with the Industrial Revolution and the introduction of factories. But why the interest in project leadership at all? Well, it's been suggested that uh, the demand for leadership within projects, programs and portfolios becomes even more pressing as projects become more complex than they certainly are. And we're all aware that organizations are increasingly using projects as a way to deliver high value and complex strategic initiatives, services and products. And at the same time, much of the experience and talent that we have relied on to date has typically come from technical STEM backgrounds or is currently reaching retirement age so that the pool of people we've got with the necessary experience and behaviors needed to successfully run these complex multifaceted interconnected projects isn't quite expanding at the same rate required to keep up with demand. And in today's context, if we think about climate change, disruptive business models, economic migration, globalization, extended supply chains, really leadership is about change. And this is how it connects strongly with the project world. We recognize that projects introduce change, um, especially for infrastructure, digitization, and organizational transformation, regardless of sector. And at the same time, we tend to be moving away from a preoccupation with project planning and control tools as the keys to success and towards the management and leadership of people and their performance. But this isn't an either or scenario, but it's rather about the rebalancing of capabilities needed. And providing leadership capability isn't just left to leaders, as I think we as the, in the project community are really discovering 
And I do believe that every project manager needs elements of leadership capability to be effective. So are some of us born to lead or do we learn to become leaders? This is an old question. We all know people who just seem to be natural leaders, those who have it, who stand out and inspire everyone around them. These are the leaders who nurture relationships, even when they're under very extreme pressure. And they are the people who retain strategic perspective, even when problems emerge. So some people take the stance that leadership is an inherent attribute of individuals. Some people have it, some people don't. But this is a pretty disturbing thought, I think, for those of us who want to use it to good effect. But then I guess it depends on how you view leadership. We aren't all the hugely charismatic leaders which people typically reach for in their minds when we talk about leadership. And leaders in the knowledge economy, such as ours, those who've moved up the ranks from team member to team leader, aren't always charismatic. It's far more commonplace to find team leaders who are promoted to a leadership role without developing their leadership skills. And that was certainly my experience. So Schmitz in 2011, he remarked that leadership is an action many can take, not a position that only a few can hold. And I think that really demonstrates the difference between leader as a title and position and leadership as a set of behaviors and capabilities. So what is leadership? It's a very simple question, yet it continues to draw extensive debate. And working through the mountains of academic literature, it's clear there are many different definitions. My own particular favorite definition is simply that leadership is a set of skills enabling an individual to have followers. This is individual may or may not have formal authority or hierarchy position, but they are highly visible and they do set a positive example. And one of the best killer questions I've come across was posed by Coos and Coltoner in 2011. And the question was asked from the perspective of the follower. And it was simply this. What personal traits or personal values, traits and characteristics do you look for and admire in a leader? Someone whose direction you would willingly follow. And they identified four attributes we require from people we choose to follow. And they are honesty, competency, inspiring, and forward-looking. So perhaps before we go on, just a, a 101 short word about differences between managing and leading. And a few of the most cited definitions differentiate between management processes, which are typically concerned with planning, budgeting, organizing, staff, and controlling, all those things that we know and love, and leadership processes, which typically involve establishing direction, aligning all kinds of different people in one direction, motivating, inspiring. And from a different perspective, the operational and the strategic. So in 2017, Kobe came out with management is efficiency in climbing the ladder of success, but leadership determines whether the ladder is leaning against the right wall. I personally believe that the lines between leadership and management are actually becoming a lot more blurred these days. One of the current notions of leadership that I think closely mirrors the matrix way of working in projects is the notion of pluralistic or distributed leadership. It comes from the idea that everyone is a leader at some time and no one is a leader all the time. And I think this idea is exceptionally relevant when we consider virtual or distributed teams that we work with across supply chains, with clients, and even our own project teams in different geographies. In the project community, for example, it's quite typical to have small functional, cross-functional teams which all go to make up the larger project team. So we're actually moving away from the very traditional hierarchy that you see on the left there with the single person um, and the sub teams be below into a lot more networked idea of a new reality here. And the new reality talks about flatter and leaner structures. It talks about new rules of engagement. 
virtual working, cross-cultural working. And there's a lot more reliance here on influencing, networking, collaboration, persuading, negotiating. So consider this in comparison with traditional, which is that the power is based on the hierarchical position with the organization. So out of this, we can see that leaders actually are at all levels of the organization in all kinds of ways. That leadership is pragmatic and it's opportunistic. It's dispersed, absolutely. And it's not just left to the designated leader. It's a shared effort. Leaders take the role in one instance and will drop it to become follower in another so that the roles of a leader and the follower are dynamic. So traditional views of leadership tend to focus on formalized title, role, hierarchy, typically on centralized command and control. So traditional leadership generally involves accumulation and exercise of power by somebody right at the top. And these are often emphasized by the lone hero model. My suggestion for a traditional leader happens actually again to be Donald Trump. As the head of a family business, he's more used to directing than consulting. And he's chosen this particular type of leadership and style of leadership to take with him into the White House as president. More recent views of leadership have actually introduced an emphasis on social and ethical behavior. So we've got a whole list there of different styles of leadership, which over the last 20 or so years, 20 to 30 years have actually come through. So for example, emotionally intelligent leadership. Well, this is the work of Daniel Goleman. He's extensively shaped and focused our understanding of leadership through his work on emotional intelligence. For him, he found that while qualities traditionally associated with leadership, and I'm talking about, for example, intelligence, toughness, determination, vision, certainly are required for success. He talks about truly effective leaders being distinguished by a high degree of what he called emotional intelligence, which includes self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and general social skills. The servant leadership there is an idea from Richard Greenleaf. And he gave us, and he focused primarily on the growth and well-being of people and the communities to which they belong. So the servant leadership model highlights putting the needs of others first, helping them develop and perform to their best ability. In authentic leadership, which was really um, highlighted by Bill George, introduces a concept of championing responsible leadership and doing things right. So Bill George identified that authentic leaders are positive people. They promote, deliberately promote openness and trust, authenticity. Then we have collaborative leadership. Well, kind of does what it says on the tin. It depends on the ability of leaders to engage and collaborate. And they suggesting David Archer and Alex Cameron in their 2008 book, Collaborative Leadership, they suggested that the basic task of the leader is to deliver results across boundaries between different organizations. They have to learn to share control, to trust a partner to deliver, even though that partner may operate very differently from themselves. And I think this style of leadership resonates very strongly with the multifunctional, multi-geographic project teams working with a variety of suppliers and with clients. And finally, incomplete leadership. This is work that was done by Deborah Ancona and a number of, of um, her uh, co-authors. And back in 2007, they talked about the incomplete leader and they kind of exposed the myth of the flawless person at the top who's got it all figured out. They're saying that no single individual can stretch into every single aspect of leadership that an organization needs. But they did suggest an organization can have it all once the incomplete leader understands that they've got to complement their own strengths with capabilities from others to make up a, a coherent whole. 
So together, all together, they provide the needed leadership behaviours and capabilities. Now, my suggestion for the new type of leader is Richard Branson, who is also very active on social media about leadership and empowerment. So I have a question for you all, and it's simply this. Can you choose one of those types of leadership style which you consider best describes your own leadership style at this time, this particular time in your career or project? Now, Rebecca's asked me to suggest that you actually write your answers in the chat box and she will collate them. Um, so you can either write A, B, C, D, E, F, or you can just write emotionally intelligent, servant, authentic, collaborative, or incomplete, or other, because you may have your own particular leadership style and leadership model that you prefer against all others. So I'm going to give you a, uh, a minute or so to actually do that. And Rebecca, I'm assuming that in the background you'll be able to collate those, those responses, so thank you. Absolutely, Sarah. Yeah. So I've, I've just put your options up and uh, we're getting Thank things you. coming through on the chat now. And I'll okay. collate all that and I'll be able to just show it in a, in a few moments for you. OK. Okay, it's coming through majority collaborative. Okay, good. A couple of servant, a couple of um, emotional intelligent, one or two authentic, but vast majority uh, collaborative. Good, okay. Well, that indicates to me that we recognize that we, part of our core competence is actually learning to work with and through others as well. Um, and being able to take and recognize different perspectives and different areas of expertise as well. Thank you. My own particular favorite style, I understand yours, my own particular favorite style is actually from Goldman's work around emotionally intelligent leadership. Because, and I'll explain why, my own view is that without this as a solid foundation, the rest of the leadership styles won't necessarily be robust. So I kind of review, regard um, emotionally intelligent leadership as the foundation stone for everything else that comes around it. But I'm sure there'll be long debates around whether or not that, that's a, a view shared by yourselves too. So from all of this, what should we now be highlighting as important and core project leadership capabilities? Which competencies do we need our project leaders to have in order to meet the significant tasks that we actually do make of them? We're asking project leaders to exceed expectations when those expectations are already extremely high. They're being given high levels of delegated executive power. And then at the end of the project, they're expected to actually hand that back. They often lead multicultural, multidisciplinary, multi-geographic, multi-time zone, virtual teams, and yet they're still, at the same time, asked to be visible. And they're also responsible for setting up, for growing, for maintaining, and then closing down temporary organizations. These are all together huge asks of an individual. And as Rebecca alluded to earlier, Having worked in the project space for over 25 years, I've seen and worked with a lot of positive role models myself. Um, and so I'm going to share with you the three things that I believe make the difference in project leadership and which are over and above the technical abilities typical of project management. And the first one is actually setting the tone. And by this, I mean setting the culture, setting the environment, as well as the, the structure and the processes within which the project organization works and how it de and defining how it connects to the outside. So this includes setting out expected behaviors and standards such as collaborative working, co-creation, and also being able to role model these yourself. The second one is around judgment and decision making. It's recognizing that decisions often have to be made within very constrained time frames, 
sometimes with limited information. But this is about making reasoned decisions with the information available, although it might be incomplete, but also being comfortable with that decision and understanding the implications of that decision. And then finally, my third one was around dealing with ambiguity. We hear a lot about this, especially around the Bucca world. And however much we plan and make plans, plans are never guarantees how much, however much we try to control unknowns. So things like anticipating, future thinking, scenario planning, working with emergence, building personal resilience, building team resilience, articulating what you do know, what isn't changing, what your team can count on. These all help to reduce uncertainty and the problems it creates. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's out there currently in relation to competency and, and frameworks around these. So competency frameworks are a favoured way of presenting skills, knowledge and behaviours that represent the organisation's expectations. Much of this early work with these kind of frameworks was focused really on performance management and development and particularly for, for senior staff and organisations. But they're used a lot more now and seen as a way of shaping and fostering capability right across all levels of the organization or kinds of job families. So some major companies have produced, have launched project leadership academies and the UK government under the auspice of the Infrastructure and Projects Authority have launched their major projects leadership academy at SAE Business School in Oxford and the Project Leadership Programme at Cranfield University for their senior civil servants leading projects right across government. And there are also project leadership competency frameworks, although frankly we still don't see many of those at all. They're, they're not as common as general functional leadership uh, competency frameworks or even project management competency frameworks. But what we are seeing a lot more of are project competency frameworks, project delivery in this case, as uh, this one is actually from the IPA, um, it's out on their website um, and it uh, was published just back in November 2017. Um, and like a lot of them, what we, we're seeing is project management competency frameworks, but with an element of, of leadership in there. So what does all of this actually mean for project leaders? Well, I'm thinking here about how project practitioners increase their skill set into behavioural and social competence, the competencies, because basically that, that's really where the leadership, the difference for leadership actually lies. And one of the most useful models I've actually come across is the transition model, which Donnie McNichol developed for the book Project Leadership. And it describes leaving behind the familiar and embracing the new over three perspectives and those perspectives being values, time and skills. So the premise is that what you, you value most is what you typically spend your time on and your focus and your attention on. But the time is in two dimensions. It's what you spend it do, your, your time doing, so how you balance work life, for example, but also the, the time horizon you're looking over. So if you're looking over the expectation of your career as opposed to the next couple of months or even the next uh, couple of years. But I think also one of the things that certainly in my uh, experience of um, coaching project leaders is this thing about skill sets and familiarity and comfort zones. Because when we do move into new positions, get promoted, learn new skills, Typically, we leave behind some of the old. Um, and this can be a little bit uncomfortable for us when we do do that. So one of the implications is at the individual level, us as project practitioners. But there are other implications as well. There are implications for the organizational level, for those delivery organizations, how they choose to develop individuals into project leadership roles. And I've already talked about some organizations and and UK government actually putting together, uh, deliberately putting together and holding uh, development programs to help to formulate 
project leadership capability within their own within the, within their own people. So in my own research, project leadership and reviewing the literature for the APM research project on project leadership, I've come to the conclusion that most writers are coming at this issue from the perspective of the organisation. So what we've attempted to do in this research is to look at project leadership from the perspective of the actual project leader. What we've identified here are skills, behaviours, knowledge and values that project leaders behave, they believe they need in order to deliver major complex projects successfully. And we think that this is a different perspective to that taken in the past. And we do hope that the output of this will prove useful for project leaders to reflect and, and the project community in general to reflect on their personal skills and help inform organisations in the development of their existing and future project leaders. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the APM research programme, uh, for the last couple of years, they've been putting out uh, calls for proposals for project for research uh, around projects, programmes and portfolio. Um, and there is a, a, a small fund available to help support that work too. So I'm co-leading that work at the moment into project leadership specifically um, with uh, Cranfield University, Professor Mike Bourne at Cranfield University. And one of the particular findings from this that probably won't surprise you given what I've already talked about is that of the, the individuals we interviewed for this research who worked in project leadership roles, the majority didn't have the word leader in their title which again I think underlines uh, this idea about leader as a position or a hierarchy. A position in a hierarchy um, is not the same as actually having a set of leadership competencies and skills regardless of actually where you are in the, in the team or in the project. Now we've completed the interviews for all of this now. Uh, we've completed the reviews, we've completed the analysis, and we're currently writing the report and expect it to be complete by the end of July. So this means that the research should be published and available and that the final version should have been reviewed uh, by the end of July. And so it will be published and available in the autumn. So that's the plan at the moment. And moving on as well how you can help the APM actually uh, support the, the new body of knowledge, the seventh uh, edition. Um, you'll have seen the call to consultation, I'm sure, for the seventh edition for the BOC, uh, which will provide a more balanced view of behavioural competencies and also develop ideas around project leadership. And I do hope you were able to take advantage of the call to consult and you were able to provide some of your own ideas about the content for that seventh edition. So it remains finally for me to say thank you for listening. I'm Sarah Coleman and I'll now hand back to Rebecca for questions. Thank you, Sarah. And as you can imagine, there's been quite a few uh, questions coming in. So the first question I'm going to ask to you is coming from Qua uh, sorry, Craig Whiteley who has recently sort of made, made a transition from the armed forces to working in the insurance industry. And, and I suppose his experiences of leadership vary between the, the, the two organisations. So I suppose coming from the military background, Craig is saying, you know, there is a very clear hierarchy. Um, actually, decisions that are devolved. Um, he actually says they're devolved down the chain, which is interesting, but but... Yeah, I can see that. But what he's saying is in the insurance industry, um, he's finding that decision making is much more network networked, as you described, or the, or the leadership is much more networked. But what that leads to is a kind of lack of clear direction. So is that his own impression or is that he needs to make the transition or what would be your insights into that, Sarah? That's a, an interesting question. My, 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 my husband is ex-armed um, forces too. So I I, I kind of get it um, from um, both perspectives. Um, I think my, my general question would be, is it, a, is it common within the insurance industry or is it common to your particular organization? 
um, because every organization, I'm sure that, that I'm preaching to the converted here, um, has its own particular um, type of culture and environment and context within which it works. So it might well be that this is particular to the organization or maybe even particular to, to the team that you're working within. Um, if I think the, the subtext I'm hearing, maybe I'm wrong, but the subtext I'm hearing is um, this kind of consultative networking bit is, is making things ambiguous, not clear, rather vague, not quite sure how to move on with it um, and whether quotes it might be the right decision or a decision that that would get ratified um, by the 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 lead the uh, whoever else it needs to get ratified by within the organization um, so my immediate response would be to actually try and understand the culture of it um, and to talk with your own manager, line manager, in, in fact, if you can get to the leadership team and, and talk with them, that's useful. But also as, as a, a team or extended team, how do they want to work? What kind of behaviors work best for them? Is this kind of consultative extended network, um, organizational networking working for them? Or are they feeling as, as um, lost and uh, conflicted as perhaps that you are as well? I'm a great believer that organizations have a great many different cultures um, and that individuals actually can influence to a, a, a fairly substantial way how behaviors or which behaviors they actually prize for this. OK, thank you, Sarah. OK, the next question has come in from Simon Bradshaw and, and Simon would like to ask you, is there any or in your experience, um, what is the most frequent error or oversight um, made in a position of project leadership? The most frequent error or oversight? Um, I think that there are lots of areas and you'll probably have seen all of the research that comes out on a very regular basis saying uh, why projects don't succeed. So. Um, over the years, and the, unfortunately, the trend tends to be the same. So it, it falls into categories like, for example, um, team working and being able to, to, to lead a high performing team, uh, developing your individual, your individual team members, relationship building, um, being able to influence at senior levels, um, being able to to talk with your project sponsor and keep them on board and keep them interested in what you're doing, um, being able to market and raise the profile of the, the project and the organization in order to help you um, keep or even get re the resources, whether that's budget or individuals, volumes of individuals or particular skill sets that you actually need. There are so many of these, they're very varied. Um, uh, if you're asking specifically in relation to leadership, um, then I think we've all got, we all know people that we've worked with during our careers, the, the ones who've really made a positive impact on us. And we, we look at and we think, that's good and I really want a part of that. I'm gonna use that myself because that really works. And we've also used, seen people as role, very negative role models who we think, I, would, I really don't want to be like you and I wouldn't do that in a million years and deliberately um, go out not to do that and to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Um, Simon, there are so many of these um, and they it, it depends on who you're talking to. Certainly the, the people that we've interviewed for the research have come out with, as you can imagine, some, some very interesting stories, um, which it wouldn't be fair to, to replicate here at all. Um, but uh, I think that all of us on this call can can understand that there are many and varied errors and oversights um, at all kinds of levels and that organizations do try to overcome those by the, the programs that they put in and the processes that they put in as well. Um, so I would be very interested in if you want to um, 
sorry, Rebecca, this goes back on you. But if you if you want to do a, a consolidated idea about what actually goes wrong in your particular projects, that would be. Um, I think everybody's going to have a, a, a comment around that. Sorry, that's no Probably. problem at all, actually. And that interestingly feeds into one of the ideas um, that I've got around doing some sort of project management um, index where we ask project managers basis, what are the things that are actually hindering their success on their project? So is it stakeholder involvement? Is it lack of skills? Um, whatever. But we'll come on to that later. OK, so I better move on. So Andrew Olds has asked the next question. Yeah. And then after that, I'm going to ask you a question around chameleon leadership from Hema Luckman. But I will ask Andrew's question first, and this is around emotional intelligence. So Andrew would like to know um, if emotional intelligence can't be measured with a number or a score or a quotient, how can we ac actually accurately sort of say how emotionally intelligent we are? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, we do like to measure everything, don't we? Um, we're, we're in a world that where businesses and organizations have a performance dashboard and have very definite measurement uh, requirements um, about what we do. Um, and a lot of people consider that in some things like leadership or emotional intelligence are, are a lot more intangible and tacit um, and therefore not measurable. But I think um, Daniel Goldman's um, areas around self-awareness, um, motivation, social skills, empathy. Um, I think that a lot of those are to do with feedback and how you how you impact other people. And you can, with a certain amount of empathy, you can actually easily, very easily recognize and decipher how you are impacting other people. You watch them, you watch their faces, you watch the body language, you listen to the tone of voice. Um, so if you're looking for pure measurements on a scale of one to 10, and I think um, that this is where competency frameworks come into it as well, because they've tried to uh, put in frameworks and matrices that devise uh, levels one to five, one to three across the top and down the side, they'll give you uh, whatever particular competence plus its description. But each one of those cells will say, this is what we expect from to see from you in this particular circumstance. Um, so a lot of it is being able to demonstrate the behavior. Uh, a lot of it is how people feel once you've demonstrated that behavior as well. Um, but very few of it is around, I'm going to give you a mark of what of one to 10 around this. Um, and uh, what we can see around it. But I think a lot of it is, is results. It's driven by results. So what was the outcome of you doing this particular behavior? Did it succeed in what you were trying to do? Um, did the other person work, walk off thinking, God, that was awful. I never wanted to, to, to meet with that person again. Or that was really good. I feel like I've turned around. I can see a way forward for this. So it, it's not the usual performance measurement bit. It's a lot more nuanced and subtle than that is, is really what I can say about it. OK, fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. OK, the next question, and this has a bit more of an international flavour, um, and this is around chameleon leadership style. So this question comes from Hema Luckman, and it's really asking you, Sarah, if you'll comment. Um, so Hema's view is, having worked on a few cross-border and joint venture projects, um, as leaders, we've actually had to transcend and adapt to multiple leadership styles to accommodate uh, cultural, country and organisational adopted styles. And we were called chameleon leadership uh, leaders. Can you comment on sort of what that style means and, and, and how you see that? It's, it's a fairly new one um, for me as well. And it's not one I, I will be absolutely honest. It's not one that I've researched terribly deeply. So uh, you may know more about it th than I do, but I do. Um, I think a lot of it is to do with coming out from the the Hersey and Blanchard is possibly what I would um, put it back to, which was a, a model which was is what well, probably over uh, forty years old now, but around situational leadership, 
and basically what it says is not in the, the way that you've described it but what it says is you you take um, stock of your surroundings um, and you listen and learn about what is happening and how it's happening and what's important what makes the difference um, and you adjust your style um, in relation to that as well it's something which can be quite stressful on an individual because it's you that is responsible for changing and articulating this uh, for, for the rest. Um, but it's something I think that um, people who are able to do it and able to do it well can be incredibly successful at what they do and how they do it. And I'm wondering whether you, um, sorry, was that Hira who asked the question? Um, might give us a good example of who you might consider would be a good role model for this. Yeah, the question came from HEMA, so yes, we can get more information afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. But that is um, that is one thank you that I, I will take away because I've not been asked that one before and I will do further. I have heard of it, but I will do some further research into it. But I do think it's one that with the, the major complex projects that we talk about, especially when they are multinational extended supply chain, multicultural, multi-geographic, I think it's one that's going to come up at time and time again. So thank you for raising it. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. OK, our next question comes from Kate Lackey. So Kate would like to ask you, how does the move away from a focus on project planning tools and towards the management and leadership of people and their performance sit with standard project maturity models. Does a new style of maturity model need to be developed? Mm -hmm. If you're asking about project management maturity models, possibly not. If you're talking about project in its wider sense, then I would suggest probably so. Um, level, f if I remember correctly, level five, it's a, it's a while since I've been working with project maturity models, but level five is around partnering and around relationship building. And that's certainly one of the, the prime behaviors um, that we expect from our project leaders. We expect them to go out and make those networks and be able to persuade and influence and, and negotiate on the project's behalf. Um, they have the wider big picture view. I think, Kate, I think that going back to my, my comments about the seventh edition uh, of the, the BOG, I'm quite heartened by what, uh, by the conversations that I've had with the editors, Ruth um, uh, Murray Webster and, and uh, Darren Dolcher, about how, how they're looking to frame this new edition because there is a lot more or potentially there's a lot more in there about um, the behavioral and social side. So I think that perhaps when we're, we're not necessarily in the space at the moment that you're, you're suggesting, um, but I can see that with, a, with more, um, with a groundswell and a critical mass of people saying, yes, projects are not just about the planning process tools, they're actually about behavioral aspects too that we need to get more involved in. I think there will probably be a movement towards what you're suggesting there. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay, this next question uh, comes from Adam Griffiths. So, um, Adam says that Burn et al. 2009 present a set of core functional requirements for leaders of creative efforts, problem solving, um, based on some work by Mumford et al. 2007. Did you come across this during your research? And if you did, do you think it could be helpful with the challenge of creating environments in which projects can be successful? Okay, so Mumford et al. is, is certainly one of the, the, the huge range of, of research, of, of pieces of, of research. Um, okay, is it useful? The answer, my, my absolute standard answer would be yes. Um, the whole idea about creativity, co-creation especially, collaboration, co-creation, different perspectives, new perspectives, not doing the same thing over and over again, looking for innovation. Um, and I'm not talking about um, innovation necessarily on a grand scale, um, but I am talking about being able to review and, and refine process um, 
and behaviours that, that suit are most appropriate to what you're trying to do. So um, creative efforts, I, I would, yes, I like that idea very, very much. For me, it comes, it comes under the space of, of co-creation. Um, so for example, some of the work I did some, some years ago with a, a, a science-based organisation um, was very, um, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, was very siloed. Um, and uh, although they all understood the flow of uh, requirements across teams for, a, for, a, for an individual project, um, for whatever reason, they, they chose not to get involved and not to have those, those, um, uh, those uh, multifunctional team meetings and being able to, to look at problems together and do problem solving together as well. So I like the idea certainly of, of creative efforts, um, being able to provide that kind of culture and environment, yes. So that's one of the, the really crucial conversations up front with project teams and, and with, with the project sponsor up front is how do we want to run this project? What do we want to highlight? What do we want to, um, what do we want to prize um, as our ambition? Our ambition is not just to, to get this project in on time and budget, et cetera, to scope, but actually what do we want to, how do we want to do that? Um, what's our approach going to be? How are we going to have the best fun? And I know fun possibly isn't one of the usual words that used, but actually we all spend a lot of time at work. So let's get creative. Let's make it a pleasant uh, uh, place and um, actually have some fun in what we do and some, some amusement and some entertainment with this as well. The um, did some work where I, I, talk, I talked with a guy who, who did a lot of work on Crossrail, and I don't know whether you, you're aware of it, but they did a, a very large um, initiative around uh, innovation for Crossrail. And one of the things that they talked about was pinched with pride. I don't know if you've, any of you have come across that, that quote before, um, but you talking about um, creative efforts makes me think about that, that phrase, pinched with pride, which basically means that you're going to borrow something from somewhere else and actually use it, build on it, and actually pay it forward to another project team for another project. So I guess in summary, because I'm, I'm kind of wandering on a bit, um, creative efforts, absolutely. Um, collaboration, co-creation, I think really ought to be by words in projects. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. So we've got about 13 minutes left of questions. So we've got them coming in thick and fast. So next question is going to be from Gareth Donovan, and then I'm going to come to a question from Lenka. So Gareth's question, this is an interesting one. Um, who, how would you deal with a Trump type leader who sometimes isn't just leaning the ladder against the wrong wall, but is insisting that there is no ladder and digging a hole instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, mm, what do you do about problems of Trump? Um, that hey, um, yes. What can I say? Um, <laughs> so is that about? Is that about how do you deal with leaders that are perhaps unaware? Or maybe yes. have we got it all wrong? Because obviously we don't know him personally, and it is, you know, very much the media portrayal. Anyway, Sarah, I shall let you answer that one. Yeah, um, uh, yes. Okay, that is a good one, Gareth, and thank you for that one. Um, what do you do? Um, first of all, you understand where he's coming from. Um, the the very this is going off track a little bit. Bear with me on it. Um, on the recent meeting with Kim Jong Un. Um, I was listening to Radio 4 running the, the, driving down the motorway and they were saying that um, it, the uh, North Koreans bought up every single copy that they could possibly do of a, of, a, of a book which was put out very recently about the White House and what was going on in the White House because they wanted to understand Donald Trump and what he was doing and what they, the, the, the decision that they came to I believe was that he he goes for the big stuff he's a big picture man he is a big picture man he's not a detailed person let's be honest here he's not a detailed person so I, I guess my, my first thing would be understand that type of leadership um, and then then you have a whole range of options a spectrum of options from that number one is just put up with it because at least you understand it 
and the other is to try and, and get him to change right down the other end of the spectrum, which frankly, with, with um, somebody like Donald Trump possibly would never happen. Um, so how do you handle it yourself? Um, and how do you handle the circumstances in which you meet this individual um, and what you need them to do? So if there's any points at which you do meet them and you need them to do a particular thing for you, for example, it might be a, a leader um, of a, an executive board or a, a, a main board who needs to ratify a decision or, or a paper that you've written for, for, your, for your project. Um, it's the people who surround people like that who actually, A, have a lot of influence with them and B, know how they work. Um, and they are, the gate, they are the gatekeepers. So often it's really useful to go and make the, the have the conversation with those individuals. Um, and possibly um, go in with, please, could you help me with this? I, I really need to understand, and, and you're really best place to, to help make move this, help us move this forward. Um, so, what do you do directly about Donald Trump? I'm not in sh as a project leader. I'm not entirely sure that you would. Uh, possibly the way to do it is a more circuitous route, a more subtle route. Um, around the people who, who actually surround him. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay, this next question, I think we've now got this one and one more question after that. So um, this question, Sarah, from Lenka Weaver. So do you have a view on if too much focus on leadership styles and what is best um, is this actually a hindrance sometimes to the success of projects as what that means is project managers are not using their natural style of leadership which suits them best but rather what they think they should be doing mm -hmm. okay but that's that is a good question and, and thank you for raising it um i think when you when i look at all of these models that are out there around leadership and leadership styles um it's not so much that people are saying, what's your leadership style? You should be collaborative. Why aren't you being collaborative? It's more a recognition that actually you flex in and out. And that's one of the reasons I like the idea of the chameleon leadership style as well. Because um, as a leader, um, as a professional, frankly, in, in any industry sector, we, we recognize that we do need to be flexible in our in the way we approach things and, and how we, we work with, with different people. Um, so although you've got people like Daniel Goleman talking about emotionally intelligent leadership and Deborah Ancona talking about um, the incomplete leader, what they're really trying to say is, have you considered this particular way of working? Not all the time, um, but for a leader, um, who might be finding themselves particularly exposed and alone, um, do you actually recognize as the leader that, that actually others can help? Others can help plug the gaps that you can't do because frankly, no one person can do it all. Um, so what I use or when I talk about these models and I say, which one do you think you are? It's often because in particular circumstances, you, you prefer, you have a preference for one type or another. Um, as an individual learning, either as an existing project leader or, or having the ambition to become a project leader and, and take leadership roles, um, it's really being aware that actually you can flex your own style to meet all kinds of different circumstances. And you won't necessarily in your mind go through, do I need to be an incomplete leader in this circumstance or do I need to be this type of leader or do I need to be that? But it's the way of saying to you and, and trying to get you to, to recognize and reflect on the fact that actually it doesn't have to be a single way. It can be lots of different ways. And actually, if you're working with a lot of different people who have a lot of different expertise and a lot of different life experience, it's a good thing to be able to start flexing those leadership competency mo um, muscles and, and do things a little bit differently depending on who you're talking to at the time. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay, this is, we are sort of running out of time, so this is the last question. Um, so the last question is actually from, from me, Sarah. Um, just looking to the future, um, 
what would you see as the sort of main challenges moving forward for project leadership? Um, that's uh, an interesting one. I, I think I'd go for a couple, um, and this is from conversations I have with project leaders, but also my, my own experience as well. I think one of them is actual virtual leadership. I alluded to earlier that um, multinational, multi-geographic, multi-time zone, etc., and 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 lots of distributed teams and sub-teams right around the world, um, and how you be visible to those individuals and to those teams, and, and make sure that that they see you and that they they get their their direction and their focus from you. So how do you do that? And I think that's that's a, that's one of, for me that's one of the, the big questions for the future. I think another one is, and this is from this is one that is coming up a, a few times now, um, is project leaders having increased business and commercial understanding. Um, because when you're working in a, in any kind of a project for a, for a client, if it's an external client then organizations obviously want to um, uh, continue to work with that client even after the project is, has completed so that often people who are leading those projects are being asked to act as kind of um, informal business development or account managers to to help um, work on and, and work up and leverage further work with those with those clients as well so I think that's a, another area for the future. Um, and I guess the, the final thing I would say is possibly developing yourself. Because when we are in the thick of it, and we, we do are in the thick of it, and it, th things like, it feels like trailing through mud sometimes, um, and it does, and things do get difficult, Having the time to reflect and review on your own performance and where you're going with this and what you need in addition to, because you don't need to do it all yourself, going back again to Deborah and Kona. So it's about understanding what's going well and, and how we manage to um, and how we can replicate that going forward. So success, but also when it's not going well, what we need to do about it. So it's about the self-management, building a resilient mindset sustaining the energy we need and, and learning constructively from feedback from success from failure um so yes I, i'd say that those those three for me are probably the challenges that i would i would suggest going forward okay thank you so much sarah and i think we're actually out of time now so that does bring us nicely to the end of this webinar uh, so that does lead me to say a huge thank you to sarah i think it's been um, very insightful webinar. Please do. I do believe we've answered all the questions, but I will just make sure um, we have a look at them and, and sort of check them that there weren't any that we missed, but I don't believe that there were. So the webinar will be, um, the recording will be available on the YouTube channel and in the member resources area, and it will then be made more widely, widely available to non-members. Um, in about a week's time, but it will be available to members uh, immediately. And our next webinar in the series will be around Agile and how to be more Agile on the 11th of September. Uh, but certainly, I think, Sarah, we'd love to hear more from you. So I think it would be really good to, to have you back in about six months, a year's time to sort of, you know, continue this conversation and give us a further update. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody else, for joining. You're very welcome. Thank you all.